Hello and welcome to today's SEI webcast, Modeling DevSecOps to Reduce the Time to Deploy and Increase Resiliency. My name is Shane McGraw, Outreach Team Lead here at the Software Engineering Institute, and I'd like to thank you for attending. We want to make our discussion today as interactive as possible, so we will address questions throughout today's talk. So you can submit those questions in the YouTube chat area, and we will get to as many as we can. Our featured speakers today are Aaron Reffitt, Natasha Shevchenko, and Joseph Yankel. Aaron is a senior engineer in the SEI's Security Automation Systems Group, while Natasha specializes in systems engineering, model-based systems engineering, and threat modeling methods, all within the CERT division here at the SEI. And lastly, Joe is a senior engineer and the initiative lead of the DevSecOps Innovations team here at the SCI. Now I'd like to turn it over to Joe Yankel. Joe, good afternoon, all yours. Good afternoon, thanks for the introduction, Shane. And uh, for everyone out there watching, I really appreciate you uh, coming in. Please uh, hop on chat, let us know where you're from. I know we have viewers in the United States and all across the world. So we're excited to hear, hear you in chat. All right, so a little bit about uh, what we're doing here. Um, what we've, we're all highly involved in, in DevOps, you know, and in cybersecurity and modeling practice and software engineering. And so we get to work with many programs across the DOD. And, and one of the things we're seeing is that programs are really struggling to implement um, a DevSecOps strategy. So we have this, uh, a little graphic here showing uh, what, what we're seeing. We're seeing basically program offices are playing whack-a-mole trying to guess where they should focus their efforts. Um, they're struggling with overspending on, on tools, on things that they don't really understand. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to help develop a strategy to allow these programs to understand exactly what they need to develop a DevSecOps system, uh, tooling, the infrastructure, and, and the people needed to build a program. Um, and that's what we're going to discuss today. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about some challenges and, you know, I'm going to introduce Aaron here to, to go over some of the things we're seeing here and uh, the things we're working on. Thanks, Joe, appreciate it. So as, as Joe mentioned, um, our perspective at the SEI and, and for this, this initiative is we're, we're focusing a bit more on government program offices. Um, all, all three of us have, have extensive experience working within DOD program offices, and there's unique challenges that, uh, that each of these offices are, are encountering attempting to uh, implement DevSecOps. So as we see here on this slide, um, this is the standard DevSecOps uh, infinity loop that probably most of us are very familiar with. It, it emerged out of industry. Um, and uh, at this time, uh, government and DOD are, is attempting to try to integrate it into their own software development uh, cycles, methodologies, and so forth. But DevSecOps isn't just technology. And that's, that, that's something that, um, a lot of folks initially trip over. So they see, okay, well, uh, if I have a software pipeline and some tools and I kind of time together and I put software in at one side, I get code I can execute and run off out, out on the other side. And I'm done, right? I've done DevSecOps. Um, it's, it's really a lot more than that. It's the, the focus is on people, their roles, and the processes. Uh, you don't even really, really technically need to automate much uh, to do DevSecOps if you've got good people and processes. So we like to think of this and kind of back out and think of it, it is, it is a socio-technical uh, system that is augmented by software, but it's primarily people who have to write the code, uh, who monitor the systems, who operate the systems on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, are working within processes. And those processes ensure that all of these stages flow neatly from one step to the next, that the correct software is being written, that it's free from vulnerabilities, that it meets the needs of the, of the, the end users, um, that operates within various security controls, constraints, environmental constraints, and so forth. Um, 
and adopting the correct set of software in order to augment that is uh, is the goal. But that's a lot um, it's a lot harder than uh, uh, than, than meets the eye. Particularly, there's no one size fits all. And I think that's the that's the crux. Um, there are hundreds of pieces of technology that could be adopted and configured in combinatorically infinite numbers of ways that can implement a valid DevSecOps um, uh, ecosystem end-to-end. -end. Which ones do you pick? Which ones meet your needs? And so that's what we're trying to, to model here. Um, we're, we're viewing this as not a thing to be acquired. This is more of adopt the right, find the right people, adopt the right processes, choose the right technology, acquire the right technology, but that's a small part, and then put it together in a way that, that uh, uh, fully meets your needs. Um, then next slide. Appreciate it. So connecting processes, practice, and tools. So starting from business mission, I'm trying to word this in a way that is not necessarily DOD specific, but what is the goal of the program? What is being acquired or built? What is going to be delivered to the war fighter? Deriving business cases and requires requirements from that. But then it gets split out into two sides. Uh, capability delivery on the left-hand side, products on the right-hand side. And if we look back at the infinity loop, the left side is typically development, the right side is operations. But when viewed as a whole, the simply the ability to deliver an application into production is a massive capability unto itself and can be developed independently of the actual applications that an end user might see. And that might be, and probably is, far more complicated than the applications themselves. Because automation is, it's harder to automate something than it is necessarily to do it manually. Um, could be an order of magnitude more difficult to have a fully automated end to end DevSecOps system with automated checks and gates and, and so forth. And all the infrastructure that's built on, all the platform tech, whether you're on AWS, I'm just throwing things out here. We're not um, you know, saying whether the right choices or not. You could put Kubernetes on AWS, um, or you could just use AWS with normal images and all the various services that it, that it provides. Um, and getting that set up before you even get an application put onto it is, uh, is an undertaking unto itself. But the program office is responsible for overseeing all of this. It's not just the thing that's being built. It's too easy to focus on, well, here's my business case and requirements for the thing that I'm building that's going to be delivered to the warfighter and focus on that and, and lose sight of the larger chunk of the iceberg that is sitting under the surface of the water, which is that platform, the infrastructure, shared services and, and so forth. Um, that needs to be developed to the same uh, degree that you would, or the same, same effort you put into uh, developing the products themselves. And so, um, yeah, like I mentioned this process as practices and tools, it's developing all of that. Um, and my personal interest right now in, in the work that is backing this is a, a lot of enterprise modeling, model-based systems engineering. You look at that infinity loop, that's a, there's no start or end that keeps going, but how do you get into it to begin with? What, what do you do in order to adopt, uh, what's stage zero that gets you into this uh, feedback loop that you can then continue to build and iterate on? Uh, that's, a, that's an area we found it tends to be kind of glossed over in the standard literatures that you'll read about DevSecOps. It's, oh, well, you get all these technologies, you put these processes in place, and bang, it's just, um, you know, you're off and running, and you're creating great code, and it's all and it's all hunky-dory. Um, but we'll see in, in the next slide here, the being in the certain division at the SCI, I really care about security. So, Even if you've acquired all of these processes and tools, technologies, so forth, um, how do you know it's secure? And that's that's one aspect. That's just cybersecurity, and there's software assurance is another big part of this too. But either just focusing on on cybersecurity, how are you sure that 
I have all these pieces in place that I, A, I've picked the right ones, and B, how do I know they're secure? Um, within DOD, there's, uh, you know, I've got my 853 controls that I need to implement, all the various overlays that my, my program may require. How do I know whether this vast Rube Goldberg machine that I've built actually has all the controls and in the right places? So the controls are going to be replicated. It's a system of systems. So the same control will apply potentially to all parts of your system. How do you know where they apply and how they apply? And so that's part of this, this uh, modeling effort is to, um, and, and when we get to, to Natasha later, she'll talk a little bit more specifically about kind of how we will map these various requirements constraints onto model elements. And so we can point and say, okay, at a platform independent level, this is where you care about these various things and do so in a methodical way that uh, allows a program office then to down select and say, okay, here's the things that I care about and here's the things that apply to me and here's where I need to address them. And then moving that model forward into that platform specific model, which is actually representative of your system. So uh, that's the goal of, of kind of where we're going. And cybersecurity is, is one aspect of it, but uh, software assurance is another big piece. The cybersecurity can largely be seen as the right side of the infinity loop software assurance, the left side of the, the infinity loop, but you need to do the, the two together. And so how do you actually know whether you're doing the right things or not? Um, that, that's kind of laying the foundations for uh, kind of what this work is. And the next year we'll talk a little bit of talk a little bit about kind of the, how the tools are selected, fit together, kind of how that methodology works, and and we'll get a little bit more into what the um, the enterprise uh, architecture uh, approach that we're taking is. And I think there's some really good points you you mentioned there also, Aaron, that this is a like I said a socio technical. We're talking there's a lot of people involved. Just this infinity loop, it's it's expanded, right? Now we we know we have business mission, right? So in, in acquisition, we got to talk, hey, how do we acquire this? We got to think a bigger picture. I need to acquire things in a way that allows me to do some of these DevSecOps ideals. So it really changes um, the landscape of what we're looking at here. Not only do we have to design a, an appropriate pipeline to enable all this automation, but I need all the different experts to chime in on their expertise on what's actually required here. And exactly. So, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, looking at a program office whose traditional role is program management, project management, oversight, contracting, acquisition, um, with uh, enough engineering support to be able to evaluate deliverables. How how do we expand that now into a world where a program office is being an integrator of a software centric system? They're taking on the role of development. And so instead of saying, okay, well, we're bringing a prime and the prime will be responsible for the end-to-end -end software development life cycle and implementing all of these things, all we have to do is feed them requirements. We'll evaluate what they're doing along the way to make sure that uh, we're getting what we expect. Now there are government or uniform civilians and, and military personnel writing code directly um, within these various programs. And so you've, you've torn away that layer that a typical ordinary prime contractor, prime integrator would do. And so now all of that, all of those skill sets, which kind of get blurred between, you know, your prime will say, okay, we'll bring all of these skill sets. It's all in their RFP. They'll tell you what they're doing. Now all of that has to be done by the program office. And, and that's, that's a, that's a monumental shift. Um, and yeah. how, how do they do that? Um. I would uh, just support what Hugh Boss said that um, approaching this issue uh, from different uh, point of view, from the uh, um, different roles point of view, actually uh, kind of dictate uh, enterprise architecture approach because uh, enterprise architecture allow you to build this different point of view on a system, allows you to incorporate voices from different uh, uh, pieces uh, uh, of the enterprise, which is PMO become essential enterprise, incorporate them into a system uh, uh, building and uh, 
show it as a one coherent piece, not as a separate elements, not as a, um, as a silos that try to solve uh, their own uh, local programs. And uh, I hope we will, uh, we will be able to show it a little bit later uh, in our slides. Excellent. So I'll, um, we have some slides up, but we just kind of want to talk about the fact that these systems are becoming extremely complex. Um, they're very hard to even hire the skill set to understand what you really need. And some of these slides just show that uh, there's more and more smaller pieces that do different functions uh, to maintain these things and to ad to administer them, to appropriately secure them. It's a monumental task. Um, there are services out there that are providing, providing some of this, um, and they're expensive. But if you try to build your own, you probably quickly find out that it's very expensive to do so. There's a lot of expertise. Uh, really solid DevSecOps processes and pipelines and toolings. It's expensive. It's, it's large. It's, uh, it's very uh, technically challenged to understand all the moving pieces. And so we've put together a few slides just talking about really basic interactions with a, with a very simple system. Um, and we've, we've put together some metrics here on the, just the couplings. And this is, again, a simple system. Here we are with you know, over 30 different interfaces between tools. Um, so the idea, what we're trying to say here is this, this is hard. This is really hard to roll your own. And it requires you defining appropriate rules, roles right, in DevSecOps, the folks you need to set your agendas, right, to decide what do I need for my program in place before I begin this, right, before I design, before I buy anything, before we build, there's quite a bit of planning that needs to happen. And, um, and then there's some hiring that needs to happen, right? There's the idea we're going to either determine where our talent is or go find that talent. And that's a challenge. And some things that we're trying to uh, take into consideration as we try to model this is identifying the critical roles, the ones you need to have. Uh, and those roles will be responsible for filling in the rest of the gaps there as far as the folks we need to do this stuff. But again, systems, um, they're, they're new, they're more complex than ever. Uh, we keep on throwing new technologies at this that help alleviate some things. But what we really wanna do is define a lot of the core tools on what they do. So our approach will be, let's talk about what we need to do. And then we'll choose tooling and people based off of that approach. And so I don't wanna hang on uh, to too many of these tools in particular, but um, the idea is this is very complex. It's, it's, it's a challenge. It's been a challenge for programs we've worked with to hire for this. It's been a challenge for us to really understand the, the big picture itself. Um, well, let's go into how we're addressing these challenges. Thank you, Joan. Um, so as was mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, that we deal in here was first of all, system of systems, uh, we're addressing uh, big and complex um, systems that support development and operation on uh, of the, uh, the system that provides capability to the customers. And this forces us to look at that from a uh, system uh, thinking, system thinking point of view. So we can't ignore that pieces of DevSecOps actually interact with each other, like we just saw a, min a minute ago, that interaction is complex, that uh, it's involved both people and technology, and uh, it should satisfy numbers, uh, like big numbers of requirements to, uh, and so we essentially have another system that we need to build, we need to analyze, we need to support, and um, it will uh, it requires specific tools. We can't 
uh, stay with the script, just scripts, uh, the silos, and um, pieces here and there. We need to approach it as a, a one coherent system. So that's why we decided that it's time to address it from uh, enterprise architecture point of view and create a PEM, which platform independent model. Uh, why, another aspect, why we wanna do that? Because if we have a model, if we involve digital engineering in our processes to develop uh, our DevSecOps systems, we can apply system engineering processes to that. We can analyze system, we can analyze the requirements traceability, we can analyze uh, gaps between requirements and capability and between capabilities uh, and implementation. We, uh, we give the people who need to build this complex system tools to make sure they build what they need to build and they, uh, they won't miss anything and uh, they make sure that the system what in the end uh, will do what they actually want to do. And I'm in this case, I'm not talking about the system that provide capability directly to the customers. In this case, I'm talking about DevSecOps system. Next slide, please. So uh, I won't stop much about that. It's just this slide you, you will be able to read later, just showing that why it, it, it's not there. So there is no uh, anything similar to what we're trying to do. Uh, there is a documentation that describe what should be done, very extensive, a lot of pages, a lot of words, and none of them is talking how to do that. Another uh, type of information usually people find when they look how uh, look on the web, how to beef your DevSecOps, the cops, you have a specific solutions. You have a sales pitch from companies that uh, give you very specific solution for the use case they, they described uh, for themselves earlier. And these use cases may be not exactly aligned with your use cases. Even it's very, it looks very nice and uh, they're very good in their job selling stuff. But if your use case is not aligned with initial use case of the tools, uh, there is very often uh, the case you, um, you won't get what you want to. You will need to do some fixes, some adaptations uh, of the tools, which essentially will do something, but not what you want. So that's why our goal to provide a platform independent model. So it, that will describe the problem and give you tools to solve this problem uh, specifically for your environment, for your application to deliver, for your organizational structure and so on. Next slide, please. I'm not, Hosh, we had a couple of questions from the audience. I um, oh, thought sure. we could answer them now. One was um, that many programs seem to have a hard time with the cultural changes necessary to begin to think about this. Um, old habits are hard to break. Is there any, even any comments on that? Um, I would say that the, best solution for that, it would be gradual changes. So you have your organizational structure right now, and you know, you you get the indication that to get where you want to, you need to uh, make your twe uh, tweaks in the, uh, in the organizational changes on your processes. It means that you will need to create a plan of gradual change. So yes, in the very beginning, you will need to make actually final decision. I want to go, I want to make these changes and get my organization into different state. This is most important thing is to understand that you need this change and commit to this change and then build a plan how you get from 
current situation to a situation where you want to be. And actually, models, digital engineering and MBC allow you to do that because you can create model of your organization now, model of your organization as a goal, and transitional st stages. And this will allow you to analyze, is it, uh, is it good for you? Is it what it's, will it solve your problems? And uh, how to better address these transformation? Otherwise, you will literally sit and uh, just speculate, and it will be more like wave hand, uh, hand waving than real solving the problem. Uh, see it's in front of you in the formalized way. I will help you definitely to address this issue. Yeah, so I know there's a, you know, pretty much a demand that we, we try to do DevSecOps. We, we know of many benefits, but uh, in our model, we are identifying, you know, critical roles. And one of those roles is your DevSecOps champion, right? This is a, a role that must be had in a program for, this, for the person uh, driving the real goal, you know, the goal of DevSecOps. So I believe culturally, it really starts with, um, there is a champion with this. We need others to believe that. So there's definitely a big cultural change, um, but I do think it's a, a change that we're going to have. Um, and we're going to probably learn along the way, the best approaches for that. Uh, I, I'd like, I was, go ahead, Aaron. Uh, I'm sorry. I'd, I'd also just like to point out that this is not just a problem with existing program offices, a brand new program office operating, uh, developing, uh, entirely software-based systems also suffers from this, this problem. And it's uh, because of the longstanding culture within the government and DOD. Uh, experiences on traditional legacy waterfall type uh, programs perpetuate themselves into the next program as a person during their career moves from program to program. And so a lot of those uh, things that worked on those older types of uh, programs those habits get carried forward. So how do we address how do we address that? Um, and that's uh, has been a, a a challenge that we've recognized of even when you're starting out from uh, the very beginning greenfield development. How do you not carry forward some of those bad habits? Uh, I don't want to call them bad. There's, there's plenty of experiences you can carry forward, but how do you adapt those to actually work within a DevSecOps world? Sure. And I think what we're doing here is we, our model is describing this ideal state. And part of the ideal state is to get capability into our users' hands quickly. And not just capability, but capability that works. And so what that looks like in a, dev, in a perfect DevSecOps world is that our end users are getting to see what we're doing early on in the process, right? And it gives them an opportunity to give us feedback. Is the thing we built, is it working? Because you know, a core thing is we need the users to give us feedback so we can iterate, right? We need to be able to make these changes iteratively, uh, securely, and provide them real value. So if I'm looking at a waterfall program, I'm saying, can I do that? Can I get a small change my user needs to them in an efficient manner, right? So I think the model potentially could expose the situations uh, the, of the current state that don't allow that to happen. And so with that, you might have a transition plan on what are the things we need to do to become uh, more agile? What are the things we need to do to allow our users to get the, the changes they need faster? Model definitely will allow you to analyze uh, and see if you have bottlenecks of your processes, for example, uh, or uh, you, you have uh, an equal distribution of automation. Uh, during your uh, processes, which affect a uh, whole, uh, whole, whole pipeline, so-called uh, 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 DevSecOps pipelines, uh, because if one step in your process highly automatic and everything happened uh, literally overnight and another step is highly manual, your process will be as fast and, and agile as your manual process. And it's hard to see uh, 
if it's, uh, for example, if your system or your DevSecOps described uh, in a document, in a Word document, there is no visualization, there is uh, no uh, validation of the model. Uh, it's just uh, human, uh, human language, which can describe the same thing in 10 different type, the different uh, versions, and everybody will understand something different on it. So it's very, it's not analyzable, really. And especially not analyzable from a point of view of repeating the analysis, repeating the same analysis over and over and cleaning up, kind of cleaning up your model, uh, tweaking it and make it uh, more efficient, more suitable for you. You can't do that with a document. Every time analysis will look in, uh, will look different. It will be different people applying different uh, uh, rules to this analysis. If you do it uh, during uh, using the digital uh, engineering, it it allow you to formalize analysis as well as uh, just description of your system. So this is uh, probably a couple of on the slides in front of you. You see. Uh, couple, a couple of more, uh, points I did before, why enterprise engineering? Uh, enterprise engineering, uh, enterprise architecture was used before, actually used in uh, building uh, the system of systems that provide uh, capability to the customers. And it's include building the processes around uh, of, of programmable systems. So it allows you to, uh, to model uh, not only behavior of computer system, but behavior of your human system and analyze it the same way as a computer system. Even it's a little bit strange, but it, it is possible. The, the main uh, point is that you formalize a uh, description of your system using the common model language. This is what happened. Probably this is the hardest uh, part in transition from uh, document-based uh, models or document-based architecture of your system uh, to the MBSC, model-based system engineering, uh, and digital engineering uh, approach to uh, solve the, uh, this, uh, this problem. When you need to formalize, you don't, you, you need to follow the rules and standards of model and language to describe problem or your use case, to describe your system in hand, and to describe your goal, where your system needs to be. Technically, this is a cause for MBC. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, kind of what we are, we're talking about. So, uh, we, we work on creating a PIM, a uh, platform independent model that will describe uh, the problem of DevSecOps and describe the behavior of a uh, DevSecOps system independent from the solution completely, independent from the platform where and how it will be solved. But it will give up uh, users of the spam all requirements all uh like high level architecture relationship between elements of this architecture analytical tools to analyze your system and um uh, and including the uh the computational system as well as your organization your human system around the devsecops and after that, the user will be able uh, to create platform specific model. So to create a solution for the problem described above okay, during PIM uh, modeling process. And then using their pro uh, 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 platform specific model to implement this uh, uh, model into real life, into real system. So we really hope that uh, the PIM will uh, give all support for the new existing, existing programs to uh, 
get this lift to, to jump from waterfall, jump from uh, separate silos, pipelines represented DevSecOps into the world where you are DevSecOps, it's coherent, coherent system, uh, working, uh, allowing working all of these pieces together in harmony and analyze it and make it uh, modifiable, uh, it's, uh, make it more ev evolvable. So if any changes need to be done to this DevSecOps system, you can, um, Simulate these ch changes in your model first, and then implement it if it's needed. Because very often uh, the changes may need a few tweaks, and it's better to do it on on a model than on the real system. First, it will eliminate a lot of risks that uh, can get your implementation uh, expensive and not working for you. Next slide, please. So this is um, this is a diagram uh, we came up uh, with. It's very high level. Uh, try to explain how this uh, PIM will work. So uh, in the very beginning, you have your PIM. You have requirements, standards, uh, planning, and out of these uh, platform specific. Um, model will be created. And uh, uh, having the uh, pl uh, platform specific model, then you uh, you will build your um, actual DevSecOps system and deploy it. And next step, it's you will run the analytics of your system, collect the data, and then you will figure out if your system need uh, to have a change. Uh, I believe uh, Joe will can add uh, some more details uh, on uh, on this diagram specifically and in different boxes uh, on that. Yeah, so at a high level, this describes what a platform specific model may be used, right? So what we're saying here is that all the requirements in an independent model should be able to produce the systems, right? And by system, we mean kind of the DevSecOps toolings, processes, and people, right? This is your system. This is a system that you would then develop an application on, right? But we're, but we're trying to describe what a DevSecOps system is, right? So people generally think of continuous integration, continuous delivery. Uh, we're saying it's a little bit more. It's it's the people, right? Your, your platform specific model will define the roles. Um, it will help you define the tooling and the infrastructure, and it takes into consideration the you know, the applications, a software, hardware that you do have to support, but this DevSecOps in this picture uh, is really describing, you know, the machinery around producing an application. Okay. And so what we're describing here is the fact that in theory, in the future, a properly configured platform specific mo model could potentially generate you configurations to uh, deploy a system. Right, so there are some really easy use cases. If you were uh, strictly a cloud-based system, microservices, this might be achievable today, right? To model a system that could be deployed. Um, but many of our needs uh, require very specific use cases. So the idea here is we want to model the system we need to provide um, to, to develop an application. And not just that, but we want to take into consideration the ability to gather the appropriate metrics, right? And so this describes a, a few of the ones uh, that we care about in terms of resilience, right? What's gonna allow my system to be more resilient, make sure I'm secure. So we've identified, and we're working on identifying more metrics of, uh, of infrastructure, of cyber, um, different constraints you might have, human risk elements, um, ML AI model risks that you might have in the actual machine learning uh, training pieces of it. So we have many different divisions working on different aspects, but a DevOps system needs to be able to gather all the metrics of relevance. Um, and uh, and of course our, our end users, right? Their feedback is a metric that we need to consider so we can uh, 
in the future be able to make automated changes, right? So this model, what it's accounting for is the fact that we have small changes. We have a, a box here called iterative changes that describe um, changes that we, our system is capable of handling, of correcting and redeploying, for instance, right? And then we also describe changes that are, are larger architectural changes, right? So these are metrics that our system might provide to expose things that we didn't consider in our model. And so what would happen there is that that now feeds our, our, our model to provide us a new specific model. So there might be real use cases out there today. Um, this, the solar winds attack comes to mind that there was a system that did not do something, right? That means that system wasn't built to handle that event. Uh, our model would then be updated to make sure that we are building a system capable of, of doing those things. All right, so this is kind of a high level look of what, how you might use this model, what it means. We have a question. Uh, thank you, Raj. You're asking, are there any suggestion to scale down proposed DevSecOps approach? Can we answer this question right now, like about scale down? I think uh, if you have, a, if you will have a model, you you can actually figure out which pieces is suitable for your use cases, which one is not. And it will be kind of obvious for you, uh, especially if you look into roles that uh, organizational a structure uh, of your DevSecOps system need to perform. And for big, big programs, big companies, it's maybe uh, departments that perform this role. And in a small scale, it's maybe one person uh, wearing multiple hats. But model will tell you that in any case, you will need to perform to perform this role. Even yeah. it, does, it doesn't matter if it's one person or a uh, whole department. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, um, scaling down is difficult because you don't want to cut out anything that's critical. And I think that's the key part of what the model will reveal to, the, to a program that adopts it, is you can't get rid of things that must be done. So, the, the lower bounds of what you can scale down to will come out of the model. And so, yes, people, you can scale down number of people if maybe level one of here it isn't necessary. People can wear multiple hats, but the model will say you, these roles need to be fulfilled, these processes need to be implemented, these constraints need to be met. That's your lower bound. And so that gives program a little bit more assurance of that they're adopting the right things and only the right things. And when they're developing a, a minimum viable product or, or standing up the program to begin with, that's what's important is you don't want to do too much too fast. That's something that we've noticed in some of the programs that we've worked is they attempt to adopt too much too fast, try to adopt everything, do everything from day one. And it, uh, it rarely works uh, as smoothly as uh, the programs would, would like it to be. But if they had a good grasp of what that minimum viable was, what the lower bounds of, the, of their scope should be, uh, we feel that they would have been able to, to execute on a much more narrower set of features and functionality and then be able to, to build themselves up. Um, there is another question. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Will any of the previous work performed by the SEI to develop reusable MBC architecture families to be integrated into this DSO, uh, DevSecOps? Uh, I think this is this is a goal. We're just starting. Uh, it's our first effort to create uh, any model regarding uh, DevSecOps. So the future iteration of this work will be to incorporate uh, other work from SEI. Um, and our main person to do, actually to guide us there, it will be Joe, uh, because he, uh, he, uh, he did a lot of 
uh, uh, um, a lot of work in this area. That's why he he is actually part of our project to guide us and uh, into DevSecOps uh, um, solutions. Uh, he and his team developed before, so we will integrate it into our model. So our model will have these answers to these specific use cases or these specific uh, uh, questions that was actual answers for, for already. So do, do you have any uh, additional comments to that? I can say it's been a real challenge and um, the creation of models actually been a bit of a blessing because uh, it's really identified the things we've glossed over before, right? A lot of us jump to let's implement this, let's use this, this hot new technology out there that's solving all these problems, but almost in every case, without a real proper design, we've missed it, right? Uh, we've overlooked something. The model's really helping us enforce, you know, at, at the requirements level and, and at the roles level, right? The people that need to be involved to make these decisions, they're, they're involved. Uh, it's, a, it's a key element to this. It's, it's really an enforcement of all these ideals of DevSecOps, how it comes together is describing it. I mean, there are lots of guides out there. Um, the problem with those guides are they're very specific. They're specific to a type of application most of the time. Um, and then we spend a lot of extra effort adopting it. Uh, we're trying to curb that and understand, you know, the specific need for our program, right? On what, I, what do we need to build to support what we're trying to do? And how do I make sure at the end of the day, I've built a thing that's meeting our, our our need, right? I need to get this feedback. So our model is trying to describe the system um, that eventually feed, you know, feed back the right information for us to improve it, right? So what we're describing here, and, and we are building some prototypes of this. So everyone in the SEI can, you know, we have experts in insider thread, malware analysis. We want to try to provide an exemplar platform that demonstrates this, because we want all this different expertise um, to come in and into play here and help us out. And, and so we are challenged with, let's get this started so we can have others collaborate with us. Yeah, it's uh, it's excellent point. Uh, saying that the uh, PIM, the uh, platform independent model uh, should be suitable for different kind of system analysis, including uh, thread modeling, uh, security, uh, cybersecurity analysis, and so on. So, in some way, you can look in a PIM as a, not only the model of uh, potential system, but also as as a tool to uh, to create a system, to analyze a system, to understand what your system need to look like how it needs to behave, and uh, also it, it will oh, actually um, play a role of uh, uh, conveying right type of information for different uh, type of people, and still be uh, still describing the same coherent system. So you can uh, have different views and still see that it's one system, it's not uh, uh, silos. So we, uh, again, we try to marry uh, different aspects, DevSecOps, system thinking, MBC and digital engineering, uh, of course, like in, uh, system engineering practices in general. All all together. I think DevSecOps in general radiated to this level to be a system by itself. Okay, so uh, who cares? Uh, I think everyone cares. Um, this, the struggle's real. We are trying to help. Um, what we hope comes out of this is that um, we get some information, we get some folks willing to take a look at this and see if it helps them identify, you know, some of the questions we get, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? We're hoping that this helps answer the questions of here's what we might need to, uh, 
you know, to meet this ideal that we're doing better. Um, and also we're, we're really taking a look at the fact that we want to, we have to understand and monitor our own system, right? Not the application, that just the application, but the system that builds the application. It's a, uh, it's a big attack surface as we've recently discovered. It's, it's vulnerable to errors. Um, and so we're trying to describe you know, the appropriate system that enables the development of software, of secure software. And I know we're down to about, uh, about 10 minutes. So, um, you know, uh, I'll take, we'll take any other questions we have, but, um, you know, this is the idea. Let's, let's build something that's more than paper guidance that, that leaves a lot of room to, to interpret. Uh, we're trying to basically allow organizations to self-assess their own needs, right? And give them the guidelines to do so, to understand what, uh, what things we need in place, you know, what type of system we need in place that allows us to securely develop code, that well tests code, that, in, that allows us to know that uh, this code can operate at the end environment. We, we're very comfortable with that, right? That everyone that has a say in the deployment and operation of a piece of software or hardware has made that say. And that's it. So I uh, really thank everyone for your time. Any questions? Yeah, I'd like to, to circle back to a, a question that came in and earlier. Uh, Mark Perna had a scenario for us, and I think this is a good time to, to, to look at this. So how do you transition to DevSecOps practices given the following common scenario? A legacy waterfall program organized around functional disciplines, well-architected, but largely monolithic software using the quote-unquote right tools, for instance, Jenkins, but with minimal true CI and CD automation. Uh, I think there's a lot going on there, and this is a very common uh, question that comes into us and is one of the first that gets asked by legacy program offices. And there's a lot to unwrap here. And I think the first one that jumps out to me personally is DevSecOps is not necessarily the be all and end all of software development. And it may not be the right approach to developing software for you right now. But that doesn't mean that you can't adopt, for instance, there are software architectures that are more amenable to your DevSecOps than others. Because remember, DevSecOps is not just the type of software, it's how you operate it. If you're trying to ship the Titanic every two weeks, it's going to be very difficult. Um, in the just time of uh, testing and verifying that you didn't break anything in a, a monolithic system like that is really going to slow you down. You're probably not going to be able to deliver that quickly. Right. But if you're able to break it down into manageable pieces with well-defined interfaces and ship those smaller pieces more rapidly, you'll probably find yourself in a situation where DevSecOps might help you out. Right. Typically, you know, we do an analysis, right? We understand these ideal situations. We want, we talked a little bit about this. We want to be able to, you know, quickly develop and get changes to our system. So I think, you know, in a typical waterfall, some of these are great. The environments work. We, we're actually doing the testing appropriately. We're, we're comfortable with our end product. But there's some pain point to get, to do something maybe faster, right? And, and so what we want to look at is here's these ideal concept DevOps say. They say, I want infrastructure as code. I want well-tested software. I want users to be able to let me know that what they're getting is good, right? So this user interaction, user experience is really important. So these concepts, we take a look at our own situation, say, are we able to deliver on these? If not, how do we improve that? So I think it's all individual. Um, it's different for every organization, but that's what you'd look at. You'd say, okay, these are these ideal concepts. Which ones can't we meet? Which ones bring us the most pain? That might be the way we focus on that. It doesn't mean I have to re-architect everything right off the bat, uh, but I might be able to bring some pain down. Yeah, um, I agree. Asking right questions from the very beginning is extremely important. If your current DevSecOps works for you, there is no question, it's ideal. Maybe you don't need to change anything. Yeah. If, if it's not, identify where it's not working. And uh, I, I'm gonna try to preach uh, again, if you, you will have the example of the DevSecOps the SecOps uh, model in front of you, and you can map your specific system element 
to the PIM and see how it's folding and uh, see if you miss anything or you like, you don't miss miss anything and can map PIM actually help you to analyze your system and find the uh, uh, breaks point or points to improvement, identify where more automation can happen, should happen. So make this analysis of your system more formal, more repeatable. Like any right now, any anything uh, we want, we want to repeat the same way over and over. Uh, so we can have uh, sustainable and uh, similar results. So again, if you will have a more formal representation of your system, your DevSecOps system, you will be able to uh, apply the analysis on it yeah, over and over again. And this is one of the actual goals to, to be able to uh, verify and validate uh, your system. This is one of the ways to do that. So it may be uh, even your uh, your architecture is waterfall. Maybe this is what happened, especially if uh, if there is uh, more hardware involved. And traditionally, uh, any hardware development, it's waterfall. It's very hard. It's extremely hard to implement agile or any iterations when you have hardware development, like production of hardware. So it's maybe it's actually you need to have more or less waterfall uh, process. But anyway, to have a way to analyze your system and uh, try to improve it, uh, these uh, what we actually trying to uh, to do with the PIM. Air, uh, Natasha, Joe, great, great discussion today. And thank you all very much for, for sharing your expertise. Thanks for hosting this, Shane. It was a, it was a pleasure. And uh, anyone, please reach out. We're happy to answer questions. We'd like to make sure we're addressing some of the needs of our uh, of folks we work with and the rest of uh, rest of the world out there. Great. And we'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Upon exiting, please hit that like button below your video window and share the archive if you found value. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the SEI seal in the lower right hand corner of your video window. And lastly, join us for our next live stream, which will be on March 18th. And the topic will be DevOps enables digital engineering with Hassan Yassar and David Shepard. Registration information is available on our website now, and we'll email that out, out as well. Any questions from today's event, please send an email to info at sei.cmu.edu. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.